Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for sticking it out to the last session. Uh, we have two uh, excellent talks to finish the symposium. Uh, the first speaker is Lori Boyer. Lori uh, did her doctoral work in Craig Peterson's lab at the University of Massachusetts um, uh, School of Medicine, where she worked on chromatin remodeling. Uh, she then came to MIT to work with Rudolf Janisch and Rick Young at the Whitehead, working on pluripotency factors, but also on uh, chromatin modifications and chromatin regulators. Um, in 2007, she started her own lab at, uh, in Building 68 uh, in the Department of Biology, um, where she made the daring move to long non-coding RNAs, the most famous of which is called, uh, appropriately, Braveheart. Um, and I think most importantly for me and for other her other colleagues as of uh, two weeks ago is now a tenured member of the Department of Biology. So let's give her a, a round of applause for that. It's not easy. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. Um, so I guess the pressure is off because now my job doesn't depend on this talk, so to speak. Um, but I would uh, like to also thank Sangeeta and Phil and um, also the many KI staff members who are involved with organizing this symposium and for providing me with an opportunity to tell you about some of the recent work that um, we've done in our lab to um, understand the functions of long non-coding RNAs in heart development and regeneration. And um, I hope that I'll have time at the end where um, I can tell you why we think that our work has also broad implications for cancer. So with that, um, you know, my lab is very broadly interested in mammalian development. We think it's a fascinating process and a beautiful example of transcriptional control in action when thousands of genes need to be turned on or off at precisely the right time and place in the developing embryo. Um, and so heart development is a particularly nice example of this because um, we know that complex uh, networks of genes are coordinated uh, to control developmental decisions. However, we know very little about um, how these decisions are orchestrated during heart development. We do know that transcription is critical because even subtle perturbations in gene expression um, can lead to congenital heart defects, which is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality in infants. Um, and to put this in perspective, every 15 minutes a baby is born with congenital heart defect. Moreover, um, early transcriptional defects can also ultimately manifest in the adult um, as adult cardiac dysfunction. So um, it's also important to note that as we age and as a consequence of injury, we lose heart muscle cells. Um, but, and that can lead to heart failure, but our heart has a very limited capacity to replace those cells. And so we reasoned that knowledge of the transcriptional switches that drive cardiogenesis is really key for understanding not only development and disease, but also may be important for improving regenerative therapies. And so while we know um, a number of key transcription factors and signaling molecules and chromatin regulators and more recently microRNAs um, are involved with this process from decades of work, um, we still really don't know how they coordinate with one another. And um, emerging evidence suggests that there are many more players in this process. And so um, high-throughput sequencing technologies and the advent of these technologies revealed really this striking um, change in our thought about the transcriptome. So our transcriptome is actually much more vast and diverse than we previously anticipated. And as you just heard from um, Jeannie, long non-coding RNAs really emerged as a new class of potential regulators of many diverse processes, including proliferation, tissue differentiation, and even cancer. And so um, similar to mRNAs, um, link RNAs share some characteristics. They're transcribed by polymerase II. And they can also be, um, oftentimes they're processed. Um, but they differ in the sense that they do not code for proteins. Instead, they regulate genes either in cis, um, as we just heard about, 
And they can either turn on or off a neighboring gene, or they can regulate networks of genes and trans. Um, and in a key example of that was just given by Jeannie, where a link RNA can actually recruit polycomb complex to different sites in the genome. And this recruitment can either lead to silencing by um, recruiting polycomb and silencing the gene, or actually this link RNA can function possibly as a decoy, allowing for activation by knocking PRC2 off a particular gene. And so um, substantial evidence uh, was mounting that these link RNAs are potent and specific regulators of gene expression. But around the time that we started to get involved with this, there were really no examples of link RNAs with roles in development. Um, but we were intrigued um, that they may play roles in lineage commitment because uh, observations had suggested that link RNAs display very cell type expression patterns. So I'm going to tell you about two stories today in general, which are centered around two questions. Um, and the first was, do link RNAs play roles in heart development? And so I'll tell you about uh, our work that identified a long non-coding RNA named Braveheart that we found to be necessary for specification of the cardiovascular lineage. And it was actually our subsequent work that showed that Braveheart was also important for maintenance of the uh, cardiac fate that led us to further characterize link RNAs with roles in postnatal cardiac, uh, cardiomyocyte maturation. And um, we started to study postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation for a number of reasons, and one in which is that it's a very understudied developmental time point um, that is characterized by striking changes and growth and metabolic control. And so we also think that studying this process has um, implications for regeneration, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So as I mentioned, um, we were initially struck by the fact that long non-coding RNAs um, show very cell type expression patterns. And so using mouse as a model for mammalian heart development, we um, examined a number of uh, uh, transcriptional profiles for a number of different tissues that represent the three germ layers, as well as ES cells. And we were particularly looking for long encoding RNAs, and I'll explain why in a minute, that were expressed in ES cells and also in the heart. And I'm showing you one example here, which we subsequently um, named Braveheart, that shows this pattern. And we were particularly interested in those that showed some expression in ES cells because initially we were interested in long non-coding RNAs um, that were important for initial specification of the cardiac lineage. And uh, we knew that many factors are expressed in ES cells. However, they're not required for ES cell state or self-renewal, but rather for differentiation. And I'll get back to that in a minute. And so we further characterized this transcript. And as you can see here, there is a major isoform that has three exons, and the minoform has two, but it's predominantly this form. And we also found that this transcript was um, um, divided basically evenly between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, but we could also show that um, Braveheart was enriched in the nucleus compared to a very highly expressed protein coding gene um, consistent with roles in gene expression. So in order to study the function of this particular link RNA, we needed to deplete it in um, ES cells initially. And we did so by designing um, SHRNAs um, against these constitutive exons. And I'm just showing you here that we can get good depletion um, in this northern um, in ES cells of our transcript. And um, although I'm not going to show you the data, what we observed is that loss of Braveheart in ES cells had no effect on ES cell state um, or proliferation. And so now the true test is, does it have a role in differentiation? And so in order to do this, we initially allowed our Braveheart depleted or control ES cells to aggregate into embroid bodies, or EBs. Um, and this process allows for the generation of derivatives, derivatives of all three germ layers, so it's really a proxy for development in vitro. And although my movie doesn't seem to be working, the cool thing about this is that um, EBs can form like clusters, cell clusters of cardiomyocytes, and then you can actually see them beating. And so what happens then is this allows us to score beating EBs and to count them to determine whether or not you're getting um, specification of cardiac cells. And so we did this, and we found that while our control cells 
EBs beat at a, a percentage that we expected, we really never saw much beating in our Braveheart depleted cells. And this is also consistent with the fact that um, we did not see activation of cardiac troponin T, which is a key um, contraction uh, protein. And so you could argue, well, maybe you saw a general defect um, in differentiation, and that's why you're not getting beating. But as I'm showing you here, we sectioned and stained these EBs, and we found that Braveheart depleted EBs were just as good as control EBs and making many of the cell types that you would expect to find. And so it's not a general um, differentiation defect. And the fact that we could also see tissues that were derived from mesoderm suggests that the lack of beating EBs is not due to a complete lack of mesoderm induction. So um, in order to gain further insights into what Braveheart is doing, what we did next is we um, analyzed gene expression changes across our EB time course. And what I'm showing you here is basically just a, a gene network where the edges are the Pearson correlation um, and the change in expression over time between all pairs of genes. And um, the nodes are the genes, and blue means downregulate down regulation and yellow means up. And I think one of the most striking results that we found is that in the absence of Braveheart, um, these cells basically failed to activate a whole network of cardiac specific genes. So for example, some early transcription factors that are known to set up the program were not activated. And of course, later on, um, genes that are involved with muscle structure and function were also not turned on. But perhaps what was most striking in these data is that in our first clue for what might be happening is the fact that this gene here called MESP1 always seemed to be one of the first that uh, were not activated um, upon loss of Braveheart. And this was important for a number of reasons. Um, MESP1 was recently shown to be important for mesoderm patterning. Um, and it also was shown to mark a key common cardiovascular progenitor. Um, and furthermore, MESP1 was known to control a network of cardiac transcription factors as well as um, EMT genes. So this suggested to us that Braveheart might be functioning upstream of this pathway um, to regulate cardiac commitment. So to analyze this further, we took advantage of a differentiation assay in the lab um, where we could um, differentiate ES cells to cardiomyocytes through some key intermediates, including, including mesoderm and cardiac precursors. And so we already knew from the literature that MESP1 was regulated by, uh, directly regulated by Brachyuri and Eomes, um, which are two T-box transcription factors known to be important for um, primitive streak formation and mesoderm induction. So the first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to look at um, the levels of Brachyuri and Eomes in our Braveheart depleted versus control cells. And as you can see at the mesoderm stage, uh, the levels of these two factors are, remain similar in the Braveheart versus the control cells, whereas if we push these cells towards cardiac precursors, um, we see that these genes, which should normally be turned off at this stage, remain highly expressed. And so this suggested to us that, um, uh, that Braveheart was necessary to turn on this program, and that it was necessary for the transition from undifferentiated mesoderm to cardiac cells. Consistent with this idea, we also observed that key cardiac transcription factors fail to be turned on um, in the Braveheart depleted cells as well. But the one thing that I didn't tell you is Braveheart is not only expressed in ES cells and in the MESP1 positive population of mesoderm cells, but also in cardiac precursors. And so it's possible that um, Braveheart is playing multiple roles at multiple stages during this process. So how is it functioning? Well, I told you at the beginning of the talk that link RNAs can function both in cis and in trans. And our uh, initial um, explorations suggested that the phenotype that we're observing is not due to misregulation of a neighboring gene of Braveheart, suggesting that it may have trans roles. So I won't go through, through all of the details of how then we um, came uh, to this point, but we then reasoned, well, if Braveheart is interacting in trans, 
Perhaps it's recruiting a um, specific set of proteins. And so we took a candidate approach to this. And similar to what um, Jeannie explained in her talk, uh, we could uh, use Braveheart to look for interactions with specific proteins. And we tested a bunch. I'm only showing you some here. But we found is that the sense transcript um, interacted specifically with SUSY12, a component of the PRC2 gene repression complex, um, not the antisense or control mRNAs, where we didn't see interactions with other chromatin regulators, um, and we saw nonspecific interactions with a number of splicing factors. And so this suggested to us that possibly Braveheart was interacting with PRC2 um, to mediate its function. But what is it doing? So the other thing that we looked at is whether or not um, uh, Braveheart could be recruiting or somehow affecting cardiac transcription factors and the level of the modification that it catalyzes, as shown here for K27 trimethyl. So what I'm showing you is just simply chip qPCR. And what we noted is in our Braveheart depleted cells, as shown by these gray bars, that we saw high levels of K27 trimethyl at the cardiac transcription factors, which is consistent with these genes not being turned on and lower levels at brachiuria and eomesodermin, um, suggesting, again, um, that you're losing some mechanism that ultimately leads to the repression of these genes, whereas control genes showed no change. So um, I'm not going to go through a lot of the data, but this really led us to propose two possible models that are not mutually exclusive. And one is that maybe perhaps at the mesoderm stage, Braveheart recruits PRC2 to a repressor of the cardiac program. And so um, without that, you cannot turn on the cardiac program, which is what we observe in mesoderm. Um, another possibility is that Braveheart competes with PRC2 at key cardiac genes to allow for their activation. And so as Jeannie also just told you, is that there are a number of studies that um, have suggested that PRC2 can not only interact with RNA specifically, but non-specifically. And so really, we need to sort this out by um, conducting much more careful biochemical assays. And um, to do so, we've recently identified the secondary structure of Braveheart using chemical probing approaches. And so now we're going through the process of making specific mutations in those structures to define the interaction and whether or not that interaction with PRC2 is critical for its function. Um, so, I've told you in this part of the talk that uh, we've identified a long non-coding RNA that appears to have critical roles in cardiac specification. And it may do so by regulating chromatin structure and ultimately the execution of a, a, a cardiovascular gene network. But Braveheart's not the only one. And our subsequent work in both mouse and, and now human suggests that there are many other link RNAs, as shown by this dark blue here, that are specifically expressed during these early developmental stages that um, ultimately lead to cardiomyocyte differentiation. And so we've been investigating a number of these, and we're particularly interested in those that um, are expressed um, at the transition from a progenitor to cardiomyocyte stage. And so um, a lot of this work is ongoing, and so I hope that I will have much to tell you on that front very soon. But I wanted to spend actually the rest of the time telling you about some new work in the lab. And you know, this work is actually relatively new and very preliminary, um, but I think it has an important impact for how we think about link RNA control, not only in development, but also in, in possibly um, representing a new approach to thinking about cardiac regeneration. And so um, we were initially um, got into this because of an observation that we made um, about Braveheart being expressed not only during these early embryonic phases, but that it also showed the expression um, in the heart. Moreover, emerging roles of link RNAs in proliferation and tissue differentiation suggested to us that uh, link RNAs could also play roles in later development. And so why did we choose postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation? Um, I think it's, uh, you know, emerging is, uh, for me at least, a really cool process, um, which is largely understudied. So cardiomyocytes actually form the bulk of the mass of the heart. And the heart is remarkable in the sense that it continues to develop even after birth. And so um, during the neonatal period, there are striking changes that happen.
um, in the cardiomyocyte population. And many of these changes are accompanied by a dramatic reorganization or reprogramming of the transcriptome. And so what happens between neonatal um, and the neonate versus the adult is that cardiomyocytes go through a major growth transition from proliferation to hypertrophy. And what happens is um, karyokinesis becomes uncoupled from cytokinesis, and you go from mononucleated to binucleated or polyploid cells, which ultimately um, leads to cell cycle exit. And this is really important because uh, Postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation is critical for proper heart function. As you can imagine, um, you have cardiomyocytes that are important for coordinating contractions that pump blood throughout the body millions and millions of times throughout your life. So you really need to form the right structures and able to, to be able to do this. And so what I haven't told you yet is that interestingly enough, during neonatal, neonatal life, and in particular the first week of life in, in uh, rodents, um, cardiomyocytes have the capacity to regenerate, much like zebrafish. During that first week, they lose this capacity, and it's thought to be tied to this growth phase transition. Um, another interesting feature of postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation is that these cells undergo a major metabolic switch from glycolysis to fatty acid beta oxidation, and um, this is controlled in part by transcriptional regulation of the uh, fatty acid oxidation genes themselves. And so why do we think link RNAs could be important in this process? Well, I suggested that um, uh, you know, their emerging roles in proliferation and tissue differentiation provides rationale. But really, um, some of our prior work on Braveheart actually suggested that link RNAs could play a role in this process as well. So we noted that Braveheart was expressed later in development in the neonatal stage. And in order to test whether or not it had a function, what we did is we isolated ventricular cardiomyocytes. And this is something that we did with Rich Lee's lab at Harvard. And when you do this, um, you can actually explant these cells. And what happens is when you explant these cardiomyocytes, they seem to go through a little bit of a cell fate reversion, where they re-express early markers, um, uh, like early transcription factors such as GATA4, and they downregulate sarcomere components. But as they're in culture and they have time to start talking to one another, they reacquire the mature cardiomyocyte uh, phenotype. And so in order to test the role of Braveheart, what we did is we isolated uh, cardiomyocytes. We infected these cardiomyocytes with lentivirus that was also tagged with GFP um, to Braveheart or control. And then um, we, we analyzed their mor morphology and gene expression at day five. Now, um, this process is also amenable to siRNA transfection, which um, will be important in a minute. So what do we find? We find that we could uh, sufficiently deplete Braveheart in these cultures. And uh, interestingly, in our control cells, we can show that these reacquire uh, beautifully these organized sarcomeric structures, whereas in uh, using two different hairpins, we could not see these same kind of structures. And instead, uh, the sarcomeres looked very, very disorganized, and they, in fact, even looked larger. And this was also accompanied by um, increases in expression of, of uh, key um, transcription factors that represent more early development, um, and a downregulation of very important sarcomere components that um, regulate this kind of rigidity. And so what we thought is that possibly, without Braveheart, um, these cells now lose the ability to promote cardiomyocyte maturation. And so for us, this really provided the impetus for looking for more um, link RNAs in this process. And so what we did is we wanted to first um, generate a transcriptional signature of postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation, because this really had not been done in detail. And so um, we chose several time points during the first week of postnatal life, as well as um, an adult. And the reason why we chose these time points, which is P0, 4, and 7, is because most of the changes that I described to you happened during this time point. Um, and also, um, as I mentioned, during the first week of life um, in mouse, these animals uh, lose the ability to regenerate their cardiomyocytes. And so what we found, interestingly enough, if we look at all genes and we cluster them by function um, and time, we can see that um, early genes that um, are expressed 
during um, postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation are those involved with ribosomes and mRNA processing. And this makes a lot of sense because you get a really big burst of protein synthesis um, during these early time points, followed by um, an increase in expression of cell cycle genes. And many of these are actually cell cycle inhibitors. Um, and ultimately, um, by um, genes involved with oxidation and ultimately uh, mitochondria and, and uh, sarcomere function. And so this suggested to us that this is a very you know, organized and directed process where you go from starting to turn off the cell cycle and exiting the cell cycle and then changing the metabolic profile of these cells. So we wondered whether or not long non-coding RNAs could actually be expressed similarly or um, in similar patterns to these genes. And so what I'm showing you here is the identification of a number of long non-coding RNAs. Um, and I've just labeled some uh, key categories that we're interested in, A, B, and C. And as you can see across this time course, you can also see specific upregulation of link RNAs um, that show exactly the same pattern of expression as protein coding genes that have these functions. And so we chose uh, 37 initial candidates um, and specifically those involved with cell cycle and oxidation, as well as ultimately uh, sarcomere structure and mitochondrial function. And I just want to point out that uh, upon further analysis, um, many of these candidates indeed appear to be long non-coding RNAs. Um, they're expressed specifically in the heart. And um, interestingly enough, many of them also um, have syntenic transcripts in human. So, that's a lot of candidates to actually screen. And so what we wanted to do is uh, to develop a high content screening platform for functional assay, um, analysis of link RNAs. And um, one of the reasons why we did this, as I just showed you, you can, uh, it, based on our results of Braveheart, evaluate tentatively the function of link RNAs during this process. But we are also inspired by recent studies that showed that using a very similar platform, you could identify microRNAs with critical roles in uh, regeneration. And so we isolated cardiomyocytes, ventricular cardiomyocytes, at, at different stages from day zero to day seven as well as adults. You can plate them in a 96 well pla platform. Um, you can infect them with siRNAs, and we use multiple siRNAs against link RNAs. Um, and you could actually use a variety of different um, readouts here. And actually, this is very amenable to fine-tuning any readout you want, and any screen is only as good as its readout. In this case, um, we can use staining towards cardiac troponin T. So we only measure, for example, prol proliferation in the actual cardiomyocytes. Um, but we also have coupled this with cytokinesis markers and also metabolic markers. And what we can then do is through high port imaging, which we've had help from Mark Bate's lab. And I want to mention that um, this was a very hard assay to establish. And um, Gizem Rizki, and, who's a postdoc in my lab, really um, was the tour de force behind this. And so um, we can show that um, you know, quantification of these markers across time can potentially identify link RNAs with critical roles in not only proliferation, but perhaps cytokinesis. And ultimately, this is a screen that we can use to determine factors for functional analysis in, in vivo. So given uh, that uh, the time is running short, I just want to show you for simplicity one proof of principle experiment. Um, and here I'm showing you some staining um, of uh, cardiac troponin T and KI67 as well as DAPI um, for control siRNA that doesn't target anything. And for a positive control CRIM1, which is thought to regulate VEGF signal signaling and has been shown to promote proliferation, and also siRNA iRNA against our, uh, a link RNA candidate. And as I'm showing you here, we can quantify the percentage of uh, proliferating cells. And I want to mention that when you plate these, there is a uh, proportion of these, usually fairly low, 5 to 10 percent, that do proliferate in culture. And um, as you see here, if we knock down CRIM1, um, we do get a nice proliferation or an increase in proliferation. And um, we can see the same for several different link RNAs. And we are now in the process, and we've actually measured this in 1,000 cells independently for each experiment. We can analyze changes in other markers, including gene expression by RNA-seq, now to determine the precise pathways. And we've identified a number of potential candidate link RNAs that show um, 
this increase in proliferation. So we're very excited about the potential results. So why does this actually, for us, um, have meaning in terms of being a great model, not only for understanding heart development, but also regeneration and cancer? So I told you that um, neonatal cardiomyocytes, they have this ability to proliferate, but then they lose regenerative potential after the first week of life. Um, what I haven't told you yet is that recent evidence suggests that cardiomyocytes themselves are responsible for creating new cells. So what is thought to happen, though very, very inefficiently in the adult, is that cardiomyocytes can actually go through a sort of de-differentiation divide, make more of themselves, and require uh, the mature phenotype. And what I don't have time to tell you is our recent work suggests that uh, regeneration using a, um, a model of injury um, appears to be a direct transcriptional reversion of this uh, postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation process. So we believe if we can identify the factors that regulate these processes, that we may be able to use these as, um, to promote regeneration in the adult. And we're particularly excited about uh, Jeannie's work in terms of therapeutic approaches, because it suggests that we may actually be able to ultimately use link RNAs for um, treating heart failure. And I just want to uh, say one last word um, on cancer. Um, I find it very interesting that the heart um, there's very few examples of primary tumors in the heart, and almost never are they neoplastic. So why is that? What does the heart do differently than other cell types? Well, we know that um, you know, they go through this process of uh, hypertrophic growth and cell cycle exit. Are there certain factors that are very important for maintaining this state that are not expressed in other cell types? And if we could discover these factors, we may actually be able to use them to control uncontrolled growth, such as in um, cancers. And so we do think that our studies here will also illuminate these types of factors. So um, I'd like to end here, and uh, thank you for your attention.